I hope that by the end of this homily, you'll be convinced that you're in heaven right now. That's my object here to convince you of that. Let's see how I do. Uh, first, I want to establish something here uh, that we are in Christ. Uh, we're all in agreement about that. Yeah, we're one body. We're all one building, head and members, cornerstone, all of us living stones. Hey, we're part of this vine. We've been grafted in. We're branches on the vine of Christ. We've been married to him for crying out loud. We are one now. The church and Christ are not two different things. He's the new Adam and we are part of this new Adam by virtue of our baptism. So we are one. St. Paul gets this. That's why he refers to our being in Christ like 164 times in his letters in one way or another. Uh, it's a very important theme for him, probably because when he got knocked down on the road to Damascus and encountered the risen Lord, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He was persecuting the church. But in truth, he was persecuting Christ. He was persecuting Jesus. Uh, who does not distinguish these two things anymore. They are all one body, uh, head and members together, the mystical body of Christ. So through him, with him, in him, a pair ipsum of the mass, uh, we are in Christ. This is incredibly biblical principle that I want to start with and establish that. We all know this, but I just want to establish that first. Now, where is Jesus? Where two or three are gathered, there he is, of course. But he's in heaven at the right hand of his Father. And today in Ephesians, St. Paul says something astounding that uh, we're already sitting with him in heavenly places. We're seated there with him. If we're in Christ, if we're with Christ, if we're one thing now with Christ, married to him, grafted into this vine. Hey, where is he? He's at the right hand of his father. Therefore, logically speaking, we are too. We're already sitting with him in heavenly places, St. Paul says. The Catechism teaches on this in paragraph uh, 1003. United with Christ by baptism, believers already truly participate in the heavenly life of the risen Christ. But, quoting Colossians, this life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay, it's hidden from our eyes right now. But St. Paul's really um, articulating something that's ontologically, metaphysically true. Even if we don't feel like we're in heaven right now, we're in the desert. Uh, we truly are in a very real sense. Uh, the Father has already, the Catechism then goes on to quote the very text from today's second reading from Ephesians. The Father has already raised us up with him and made us sit with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay. Our commonwealth is in heaven, St. Paul says. Or the letter to the Hebrews. You've come to Mount Zion. Really, this is a reference to the liturgy, to the Mass. is where we experience this most directly. Where it becomes most apparent to us. Where the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem touch each other. Heaven and earth, time and eternity intersect here in the Mass in a very special way. We enter into a holy communion with our heavenly bridegroom. Become one with him. We are in Christ in a special way, in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we are entering into the divine liturgy here on earth. That's really what the letter to the Hebrews is getting at when it says this, you come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festival gathering into the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. You all are enrolled in heaven. Assembly of the firstborn. So St. Catherine of Siena says, all the way to heaven is heaven. Because our Lord said, I am the way. So we're in heaven right now. 
may not seem like that. But I'm telling you, whatever you see, you see a desert, you see a wilderness, you see this salt wasteland, that's a mirage. If with the eyes of faith, uh, you are actually in heaven right now, folks. Uh, so I want to look at C.S. Lewis here in a book he wrote called The Great Divorce. How many people have read The Great Divorce? One, two, three, four, five, six. Any more over here? Seven, nothing. Womp, womp, womp. All right, hey, look. It's only 100 pages, folks. It's a tiny little book. It's a dang, it's a snack. You got to read this, The Great Divorce. It's a very interesting book, very creative an imaginative book about these uh, souls in purgatory. Yes, C.S. Lewis believed in purgatory, even though he was Protestant. And these souls are down there in this twilight zone, like on the outskirts of hell, and it's like this dingy town. And a bus rolls in, and all these people are waiting to get on the bus. They get on the bus, these ghosts, these souls, and they clamber on, bickering and fighting. Uh, their souls in purgatory, they're being a given a chance to get to heaven. So the bus takes them across this great chasm or abyss and it drops them off on the outskirts of heaven in this valley. And then the saints and angels come and encounter these ghosts, get off the bus. They're so unreal. Uh, they walk on top of the blades of grass. It actually hurts their feet. They're walking around. They don't even bend the grass blades. And then they have these encounters with angels and saints who try to persuade them to come to the mountains, to come deeper into heaven, into deep heaven. Uh, and many of them are still, you see that they're holding on to something's keeping them in purgatory, that they're holding on to whatever it is. And the saints and the angels are trying to persuade these individual souls. Well, C.S. Lewis is part of this uh, bus journey. He puts himself on that bus. He put himself in purgatory as one of these ghosts. And he gets out with the other ghosts. And he's like, they all split up and have these in separate encounters. But he's like watching and narrating for us all these encounters. It's, it's, it's very interesting. But eventually he himself has an encounter with a saint. C.S. Lewis encounters his great hero at the crux of his conversion from atheism to theism and eventually to Christianity. Uh, that really, what helped trigger that or launch that one important watershed moment was reading this book, Fantasties, by this author, Scottish author named George MacDonald about this guy who goes to, into eternity and comes back and anyway. So he, uh, he encounters the actual author himself, who's now a saint, George MacDonald, who inspired C.S. Lewis. And he's just in awe meeting him, his hero. And George MacDonald says to C.S. Lewis some really interesting things pertaining to this topic. Some great insights here in, the, in this book, The Great Divorce. So let's hear from George MacDonald now, who's a saint, talking to the ghost, C.S. Lewis. He says, both good and evil, when they're full grown, become retrospective. Key word, retrospective, looking backwards. Not only this valley here in the outskirts of heaven, but all their earthly past will have been heaven to those who are saved. Not only the twilight in that town down there, you know, in Hades. Oh man, what's up with that? My battery's going dead. I had that thing on the charger all night. All right, hold on. Twilight, in that twilight of that town, not only the twilight in that town, but all their life on earth too, will then be seen by the damned to have been hell. That is what, what mortals misunderstand. They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for what we're dealing with down here. The agony of our lives. It's aggravating for somebody to tell me I'm in heaven 
when we're suffering aggravations and difficulties, adversities, privations of all kinds? How is some heavenly bliss going to make up for that? But what we don't realize, George McDonald says to C.S. Lewis that they don't realize they're in heaven. And once they get to heaven, heaven will work backwards and turn even their agonies in this age, in this life, into glory, into something glorious, retrospectively, when we get to heaven. We'll look back and see, I was in heaven. I was experiencing all the spiritual blessings found in Christ Jesus, our Lord, while I walked around down here. Both processes, heaven and hell, begin even before death. Really aligns perfectly with uh, these thoughts that we're already sitting in heavenly places right now. That we see biblical example of. That is why at the end of all things when the sun rises here in heaven. And the twilight turns to blackness in hell. The blessed will say, we've never lived anywhere except in heaven. And the lost will say, we were always in hell. And both will speak truly. Ah, the saved. What happens to them is best described as the opposite of a mirage. This is cool. What seemed when they entered it to be the veil of misery turns out when they look back to have been a well, an oasis. A mirage is something when you're stumbling in a desert waste, you see what looks like an oasis with palm trees and springs of water and you're dying of thirst, stumble through the sand and dive into this pool and all you come up with is handfuls of sand. There was nothing there. What's so interesting is George MacDonald, the saint who's in heaven, reverses that retrospectively. And he says, it may appear to you right now that you're in a desert wasteland, uh, but you're actually in heaven, metaphysically, ontologically, right now. That's the truth of the nature of reality. And we'll see that uh, what we thought was a mere agony and a desert wasteland, that was the mirage the whole time. And where present experience saw only salt deserts, memory truthful, truthfully records that the pools were full of water. Heaven is not a state of mind. This is the key. It's not just a nice attitude we ought to have, you know, this nice pious thoughts, hey, yeah, we're in heaven. No, heaven is reality itself. Heaven is reality itself. That's an incredible philosophical, theological thought. Heaven is reality itself. Everything that is in accord with God and his ways is reality. All that is fully real is heavenly. All that can be shaken will be shaken, and only the unshakable remain. So everything down here that is of God and his ways, like love, God is love. When we love, our fruit endures. It's the one thing that will remain. Uh, that is the life of heaven. When we live the life of heaven, living according to God and his ways, those things remain. Why? Because they're real. And they will remain. They will not be shaken. Shaken is a very interesting topic in the Old Testament and the New. Some of the prophets and in the Psalms, this idea of God shaking everything down, shaking it loose. Our Lord takes this theme up when he's talking about the wise builder. You know, and when the floods come, the winds howl, the rains beat against this house that's built on rock, it won't be shaken on that day. If it's built on God and his ways, it's participating in real things, in reality. The letter to the Hebrews is um, very profound on this whole point of God shaking everything. Um, final point. Where's my homily? Uh, final point here, just folks, I hope this uh, gives you joy of heart. Something to reflect on and chew on that gives you joy of heart and hope down here. That's 
what this weekend's all about. We're in rose vestments. This is Laetare Sunday, fourth Sunday of Lent, where we're to rejoice. Okay. Uh, this is something to rejoice about. Uh, if we have the eyes of faith to see it. When you feel like you're in a salty wasteland, remember that you're always, you're right now in the present tense. Paul uses the present tense. He says that right now you're sitting with him in heavenly places. So when you feel the pain, the pinch of this life, just say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 